some kind. So uh, just before we we actually went live for that night, told me that uh, an enormous amount of people were probably going to see this show, probably more than uh, uh, you know. If I played in My Fair Lady for a hundred years, uh, there would still be. Uh, more people watching us that one night, which is a little daunting as you're about to go live. We did one performance, we rehearsed it, of course, and then we did one dress rehearsal, and then the performance was live. And that is terrifying. The build-up to it was very, 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 uh, very important. Nervous making for me because my God, it was going to be live in front of so many millions and millions of people, you know. And I had so little experience, so I pretended to be cool, but I wasn't. Some of the people might not understand that a lot of things do go wrong, and I, I just thought it was going to be the greatest train wreck in the history of show business. <laughs> On March 31, 1957, the CBS Television Network presented Live and in Color, a new musical written specifically for television, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, starring the incomparable Julie Andrews. Hi, I'm Ted Chapin, president of the Rodgers and Hammerstein organization, and we're going to take a look back into the creation of this original production. Rodgers and Hammerstein were the kings of Broadway. And when it was decided to do this television production of Cinderella, it seemed to make sense to do it in New York, where all the talent of Broadway could be pulled into the production. Keep in mind that this was pretty early television, and the actors needed for most all of television came from the theater anyway. And while most of the cast were pretty experienced people, one character in particular, that of the prince, ended up going to an unknown actor, someone who became known years later, as Chief of Police Fletcher Daniels in Hill Street Blues. And then I went to a R Richard Rogers' apartment to sing for Richard Rogers uh, on Park Avenue in his magnificent apartment. And scared out of my gourd. <laughs> That's how I got the job. Richard Rogers gave me the job. I was in his, um, in his music room, this vast room that was absolutely empty because he was having it redecorated or painted or something, I forget. And uh, the only thing in the uh, room was a big, tall, big, tall ladder, A-frame ladder, and his piano. And he walked in, and there was no place to sit. So I walked, I climbed up the ladder and sat at the top of the ladder. And he walked in the room. He said, what are you doing up there? I said, well, you got no chairs. So he said, come on, sing something for me. He's very gruff. And I walked over the piano, and I gave him a piece of music. And I said, I'm really nervous. He said, that's your problem. <laughs> So I sang and I left. I figured, man, I didn't get this. But I got the job. I knew I was a part of something very exciting and different. I just knew I was a part of it. And Alice Ghostly and I had such fun doing it together. Why would a fellow like a girl like that, a girl who's merely lovely? That's Alice. I sang it like this. I went. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I didn't audition for that show, you know. I was very lucky. They called me and asked me if I wanted to do it. They just came right out and said, do you want to be one of the ugly sisters? <laughs> I said, oh, yes. I was in Little Abner, as Daisy made. The, I, the shows, as the shows got younger, the age, I was getting older, so I was afraid I was never going to get a part of it in my own age again. And then Bill and Jean Eckert who were the, uh, they did all of the um, sets and any, any st static pieces for a lot of dancing in Little Abner. And they said, we're going to do this uh, Cinderella. We thought you might like to play the fairy godmother. And I said, oh boy, finally, I'm not 12 years old anymore. Rounding out the cast was Ilka Chase as the wicked stepmother. And for the king and the queen, 
a pair of Broadway royalty, husband and wife, Howard Lindsay and Dorothy Stickney. You know something? What? I love you both. I love them all. I really love them. And, you know, I mean, these people were legends, like Howard Lindsay, his wife, Dorothy Stickney. Howard Lindsay star wrote and starred Life with Father, that was the long it still is the longest running play in the history of Broadway, that he starred in for like I think eight years. And then he wrote Life with Mother that Dorothy Stickney started. They were major, major Broadway people. And they treated me so well. They had this magnificent duplex apartment, I think also on Park Avenue, with butlers and maids, and and they invited me to dinner and things like that. I mean, it was like, you know, for a kid, I had to borrow a coat, you know. I had nothing. And then to be in the presence of Howard Lindsay and Dorothy Stickney, you know, that's what I don't understand about today in the show business. I so admired the people that were so much older that achieved such excellence in show business. I'm in awe of people that really achieved that kind of ex excellence. And it was so funny because they'd pack their own little lunches. They never went out to eat. They'd have their little pear and their little sandwich, and I thought, Howard, Lindsay, and Dorothy Stickney, my. Well, it was just a thrilling experience. I made some wonderful new friends on, on, on the uh, television show. Um, Kay Ballard and Alice Ghostly. I, I knew Alice for, oh, she, she subsequently was on a, another television show that I did simply because of the friendship we'd struck up on uh, Cinderella. And um, Dorothy Stickney and Howard Lindsay played the king and queen, and they were very kind to me and uh, in later years um, lent me their country house when I was getting really exhausted in My Fair Lady. Uh, I could go out there for the weekend and kind of recuperate. Uh, Edie Adams, as the fairy godmother, uh, stayed a friend for years. And uh, also there was one wonderful um, new relationship that I began. It was our floor manager of the television show. And uh, it was a young, nice-looking gentleman um, who was always present with the earphones on and talking to the, talking to the booth and things like that. And uh, in between takes and in while waiting endlessly for setups and things, we would uh, chat. And uh, he told me that he was planning, after this particular production, to really launch a new uh, public theater in the park. And uh, this gentleman's name was Joe Papp, Joseph Papp. And uh, I will never forget my thinking, what public theater, free theater in, in, in Central Park? I wonder if he'll ever pull that off. <laughs> oh, gosh, that gentleman became so huge and so famous. And what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing he did for everybody. For composer Richard Rodgers and lyricist librettist Oscar Hammerstein II, the night of Cinderella's airing marked the 14th anniversary of the opening of their first collaboration, Oklahoma. In their many shows together, they were seldom apart, except in the writing of, of all things, Cinderella. A series of interesting letters exists with Oscar Hammerstein in Melbourne, Australia, attending the 1956 Olympics, and Richard Rodgers at his office on Madison Avenue. It gives us the only glimpse into the collaborative process of these two giants. What's interesting about the letters is Oscar Hammerstein is asking the composer whether it's musically literate to go from a major key to a minor key. And Richard Rogers, the composer, is asking the lyricist if it's literate to have split infinitives in the lyrics. In the last of these letters, characteristically, Richard Rogers says, Oscar, why don't you just come home? We will sit down together and iron out any concerns that either one of us may have or may ever have. In my own little corner, in my own little chair, I can be whatever I want to be. The actual sound of Richard Rogers' music which was so wonderfully helped by Robert Russell Bennett's marvelous orchestrations, um, was was such a spare sound occasionally. And there was this um, 
uh, thing that he did, like as I said, in, at the uh, in uh, my own uh, own little corner, is a wonderful example where it goes sort of from major into minor and then out into major again. Um, uh, I think that nobody, except perhaps Strauss and later Henry Mancini, wrote as many great waltzes as Richard Rogers wrote. They were glorious, and to sing them is an absolute joy. But the real thrill was that first day of rehearsal when Richard Rogers gathered us all and he played the score and Oscar Hammerstein, well, he couldn't really sing, but recited to the music. And I tell you, I thought I was in heaven. But when he sang, do I love you because you're beautiful or are you beautiful because I love you? I tell you, the tears streamed down my face. I thought, my God, what a genius. The simplicity of his lyrics. Oh, they were, well, what can I say? I, I was just in awe around Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein at all times. To the best of my recollection, um, I don't think they were in the studio a lot. Um, I worked with Mr. Rogers. Uh, I first heard the music with Mr. Rogers. Um, saw less of Oscar Hammerstein, but there was one wonderful day when I was waiting to make an entrance in the, in a, behind a, a flat in the studio. I was just waiting to go on. And for some reason, and I have no idea why, I was humming a song, uh, which is called The Last Time I Saw Paris. And um, I either was humming it or whistling it or something, and a voice behind me, said, you know, I meant every word of that lyric when I wrote it. And I turned around and it was Oscar Hammerstein. And I said, oh, Mr. Hammerstein, I'm terribly sorry. I had no idea that you had written that beautiful song. And he said, yes, when I went back after the war, the city struck me in, in the center of my heart and I felt I had to write that lyric. And it was just sharing that quiet moment in the wings of Cinderella, uh, it was, quite magical for a moment for me, and uh, that song's always had a special meaning for me ever since. Uh, it is a beautiful song. I really, at that time, never knew that he had written it. I do remember that Ralph Nelson was directing, and he had um, Richard Rogers in the control room, because Richard Rogers was very fussy about his music. He was just really fussy, and it had to be right. And on the last run-through, I'll never forget it, he said, here, Mr. Rogers, you have a whistle, and if you see something that you don't like, you just blow that whistle. And he said, okay, so they're getting down. Like, I forgot, if it went on at 8 o'clock, it was like quarter to 8. And everybody is there. The orchestra was in another room, luckily, but the dancers, the kids, the choirs, everybody was there. And all of a sudden, we're all on stage. People are hiding the dressers behind vases. People are dancing everything. And uh, Mr. Rogers blows his whistle. He goes, and of course, everything stopped. Totally stopped the whole machines, the chorus, the uh, orchestra, the whole, everything came to a grinding halt. Yes, Mr. Rogers, what is it? That boy in the second row in the back, you're singing an E flat instead of an E natural. The art of making a television studio out of a legitimate theater was removing the seats from the orchestra level and covering it over with a concrete platform that matched the level of the stage, making as large a space as possible. For theater people, this may have looked like a great deal of space, but for a live television musical with 56 cast members, 33 orchestra members, and 80 in the crew, in addition to a story that takes place in many different locations, made the production of Cinderella seem not unlike a Marx Brothers movie. I mean, there was, it was like this, this kind of room, and they're, and they're doing sweeping things, and if anybody had pushed hard, you know, the flat would have been over, and there would have been 12 wardrobe people there waiting with clothes. It was, just, it was just the most incredible thing, and they were mostly theater people who were used to much discipline and counting on everything working. And I thought, Given the things that could go wrong, nothing went wrong. It was absolutely amazing. There were a lot of 
things like tearing around, hoping that you were getting the right angle. Uh, you know, on, in the theatre, you, you've had tons and tons and tons of time to work it out. You've been out of town. Uh, in this one particular performance for, for uh, television for one night only, it was a bit of a scuffle, which would be putting it mildly. And when they finally showed me where we were going to do this, I think it was, called, I don't remember the name of the theater, but it was a legit theater. And not a big musical theater, it was just a theater theater. And they had re fixed it over so that the CBS Symphony could, could play in it. And it was really a, are you ready, hi-fi, hot stuff studio. I mean, you really know that you're running from one place to another and people are ripping costumes off you and putting them on you and you have to make your entrance there and you just exit it over there and there's no cutting. So you have to be there. So there, that's why there's so many wonderful shows about live television, about things, things going wrong uh, on camera because there's no help for it, you know? So it's very, very different. It's a very, very different feeling too. Uh, to know that people are watching live. In this studio, they had not just the cast of characters, but there was a chorus in there. There was a corps de ballet in there. And when they, wherever they were doing the marches, they had to march up the stairs and down the stairs because they only had 10 feet. And when they were doing these big sweeping waltzes, it, was, it wasn't any more than 15 feet. And if you had even touched anything. There was somebody hiding behind it. They couldn't, nothing could fall over. No matter what you thought, each time the pressure was tremendous because it was only that time and you couldn't go back and say, oh, I missed a lyric. Oh, I missed a word. Mm -mm. You had to do it. That was it. We were doing um, quick changes as we were saying dialogue. Our, our, our director hoped very much to, to make the this particular Cinderella as real as possible. And so uh, the, the magical uh, transition from, from uh, rags to riches was, was literally done on camera as the uh, show was going on. So in the studio, you know, uh, the camera would pan down to my feet and you'd see that uh, I had the magic shoes on and then grad as the camera is panning up, my, somebody's trying to put a crown on my head and, and gradually as it gets to me, you hope that it's not going to be tilted or anything like that. This was live television, which meant no second takes, no second chances, and anything could happen. Do I want you because you're wonderful? Or are you wonderful because I want you? I goof big time. Yeah, I goofed big time. Oh, and it really hurt me. It hurt, it hurt my heart because I love Dorothy Stickney. She's like my mother, you know. And, uh, and I overrode her in the reprise of uh, Do I Love You Because You're Beautiful. And um, I th in the show, you see, they cut to her. In the control room, they cut to her, and she takes a deep breath to sing. And I sang right over her. And I knew it immediately. And I, oh, God. It really hurt. I cried afterward in my dressing room. And she came in and said, no, darling, we all make mistakes, no problem. Cinderella was a very big deal for CBS, partly because they wanted to do better than NBC that had had enormous success showing Mary Martin in Peter Pan not once but twice in the years preceding Cinderella. Therefore, they committed an unprecedented $370,000 to the budget of Cinderella. And because they had gone all out, they were determined to roll out the largest PR campaign in the history of television. There were interviews, newspaper interviews, and, and a lot of people wanted to interview me because I was the unknown. I was an unknown factor in the show. I was the cipher in the show. The sponsors, Pepsi-Cola and Shulton, went all out. Pepsi-Cola even printed five million comic books of Cinderella, which they inserted in six packs of Pepsi prior to the airing. And Columbia Records invited the entire cast down to their 30th Street studio, where under the direction of Goddard Lieberson, they made an album that was for sale at your local record store first thing Monday morning following the telecast. And in perhaps the greatest PR coup of all, Ed Sullivan invited Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein onto his program the Sunday prior to Cinderella, both to give America a little preview of what was in store, but also to urge them all to tune in next Sunday to see Cinderella. 
It all led up to the evening of March 31st, 1957. Regular programming was preempted, Cinderella Live went out over the wires, and everybody wondered, had all the PR worked? Was anybody watching? We walked outside, I walked outside the theater, Sunday night, um, March 31st, 1957. And uh, the streets were absolutely, it was raining, and the streets were absolutely deserted absolutely deserted. There were no cars, there were no people. It was almost as though they had dropped a neutron bomb and the buildings had been preserved, but all the people had died. And it was a very, very peculiar feeling. Everybody was inside watching the show. It was the largest tele audience in the history of television at that time, and still would be considered a huge audience for a television show. I think it was like 130 million people. And the population of the United States then was only like 185 million people. Maybe 200, maybe 200 million people. Whew. Huge. Major portion of the, of the world, the of, of world was watching. Cinderella made television history. According to Trendex, the Nielsen ratings of its day, an astonishing 120 million people in North America tuned in, averaging an amazing 4.43 people per television set. And since it was written by Broadway theater people, it's not surprising to know that Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella has since had a healthy life on stages across the country and around the world. It's also been remade twice for television. Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella proved to be a milestone in television history, and it also proved to be a milestone in the lives of the people who brought it to life. And the greatest compliment I ever received in show business was from Mr. Hammerstein, who came up to me and said, Kay, you're becoming a consummate artist that has etched in my mind from the master. One day, my, my daughter was, oh, how old was she then? It was very, very young. Just went down to sleep. I said, oh, Julie, do me a favor. Just walk in. She adores you. She was happy. I said, honey, honey, wake up. And she goes, oh, Judy, Judy, Bob. Oh, oh, it was just, she just loved loved uh, Julie. She was so, and so she was so sweet and accommodating to do that. I saw Julie Andrews in a restaurant about maybe four or five months ago, and I wouldn't have said anything to her. I was having dinner with Betty White and some friends of mine, a couple of agents and so on. <clears throat> uh, and um, she walked out with her husband. She left while I was still eating. And, uh, this a friend of mine from way back then said, there's Julie, there's Julie, go talk to her. I said, no, 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 I don't want to bother her. And I'd never seen her since. And my wife, very aggressive, my wife went running out. They were waiting for their car to be brought around. My wife went running out and said, your Prince Charming is inside. She said, no, is John inside? So she came running in. We embraced, and it was such an emotional moment. As to the reaction afterwards, I think I was aware that it was successful, that we did draw a huge audience. But right after Cinderella was over, I went back into My Fair Lady. Uh, I had only taken a small um, leave of absence in order to do the program. And back into the theater I went, and uh, it was kind of business as usual and going back to my day job. So the real impact uh, didn't hit me. Uh, I think that one was just so busy doing in those days and getting on with one's life and one's career and it was sort of um, head down, nose to the grindstone and getting on with one's job. And it's only now that I look back that I think, wow, wasn't that extraordinary? <laughs> Like it so well, and for all I can tell, I may never come down.